Welcome everyone, uh, welcome here uh, in this room and welcome uh, on screen uh, somewhere. Uh, we are together for a uh, special uh, discussion this afternoon on migration, the societal challenge of migration. My name is Odile Heinders. I am part of this um, uh, presentation here. I will uh, inform you about uh, the Honors Programme. Uh, then I will give the floor to my colleague, uh, Corny Rijken, who will talk about uh, Timigo, the research network that we have at Tilburg University. Then I will give the floor to um, two uh, speakers, pre presenters today, Max Spotti. He uh, works at the Faculty of um, uh, Humanities and Digital Sciences. And then uh, the other speaker today will be Mario Brackman, Brackman, sorry. He is um, working at the law faculty. And after that, we will have a discussion and that will be uh, led by our colleague, uh, Christophe Van Mol. Um, and then uh, we promised you to have an opportunity for networking and drinks, but I guess we do that uh, the next time that we can meet in person. Have we organized this as an in-person meeting, but we all know how that changes every week. Uh, the first thanks that I want to uh, say is to Annelieke Koster, Studium Generale. She has organized the whole event. Thank you, uh, Annelieke, for uh, helping uh, us out. Okay, first a short presentation on what we are doing in the context of the societal uh, challenge of migration from the perspective of research. And I open my PowerPoint for that. Um, yeah, please Max help me out because. <laughs> If you share now, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, I will um, uh, tell you a bit about the honors program, and I will not do that on my own. I've only four slides just to inform you, but I have invited one of our um, uh, uh, fantastic students, Lina Zanftenberg. Will you be there, or will you join me, or will you join me later? <laughs> it's more fun to be here uh, to be here together. Um, okay, so the Societal Challenge of Migration is uh, the honors program that we have uh, in Tilburg uh, University, and that means that we are offering uh, students on top of their regular program, uh, uh, a short program of four courses, interdisciplinary courses, and all these courses are um, um, uh, somehow connected to migration, but also all of them cho have chosen another perspective to put on the whole, uh, on, on all the issues of uh, migration. Uh, and just for a start, I did one of these courses this semester, so from September on to uh, today, and you were in uh, this course, Lina. Uh, and one of the things that happened at the time uh, made it enorm uh, immediately enormously difficult but also interesting eh? from September until now. Now it started with uh, the fall of Kabul, so to say. Many people who would uh, who wanted to get out of um, uh, Afghanistan, many people who entered uh, Europe or other uh, nation states and who really uh, uh, had positioned themselves in the, in, uh, as migrants on, uh, I want to get out, I want to live somewhere else. That was in August. Uh, then we had we still have the enormous difficult conflict in uh, the east poland and belarus a, a typical border conflict very very complicated from the perspective of what is happening here and who is doing what and why are suddenly all these migrants in belarus and what is the political uh, context in which this is happening and uh, quite um, uh, recently, we talked about even in our course on uh, the, the tragic um, uh, events that were happening eh, on the sea between Calais and the UK. Uh, and again, the very complex European context in which this is happening. 
have the minister of France telling, oh, the UK is much too easy. Everyone can work there as an illegal uh, uh, person. And then the UK saying you are not um, uh, uh, doing your border control very well. So everyone is saying something about what the other should do. These are things happening today, but in the program, in the courses that we offer you, of course, we put these events in a bigger context from different perspe perspectives, different paradigms, different uh, research uh, questions that, that we uh, try to, um, uh, to discuss and, and in a way to answer from uh, have with, with the student group. What is very important, and uh, I hope that, that um, Lina will tell more about it, is that these courses are very much, I think, engaging discussion. Uh, uh, we are not offering you just, okay, this is knowledge, reproduce it, but we really try to find out what students think, what are the perspectives on issues like this happening, and, and um, also, what are the consequences? What is the responsibility for students today in regard to this type of difficult questions? So I would say this is really education with, uh, with an impact. Um, here is a slide in which you can see what four courses we are offering now, and also how our uh, Rector Magnificus Wim van der Donk is, is, uh, is enthusiastic about um, uh, the program. Uh, he he uh, explains on the website of uh, Tilburg University that you can choose this in your bachelor program when you have more than uh, seven average in your first year. Uh, and you can do it uh, to uh, broaden your knowledge with other scientific di disciplines. Uh, and if you have done it, you will certainly uh, get it a certificate that you have uh, done this uh, honors program on top of your um, uh, a regular program. These are the courses that we have organized starting in the beginning of 2021. So last uh, January, February, first courses were theoretical perspectives on international migration that was organized by Christopher Moll from uh, the School of Social Sciences and Behavior. Then border and trajectory, sorry, I see a typo here. Uh, Connie Rijken uh, together with um, uh, Miriam van Rijven, law faculty and uh, uh, humanities and digital sciences combined. Uh, in September, I started with migrant narratives and experiences, very much a humanities uh, uh, topic, but then related to um, uh, interdisciplinary concepts as well. Uh, and of course, it also started in uh, September is perspectives on the uh, economic, uh, economics of migration by uh, Kulan Anton Garel. And you can see that that is really a, a Tyson uh, course from the economic uh, faculty. Uh, maybe you can say a bit more later, uh, Lina, about the differences of the courses or what you liked most in them. I have just another slide to inform you how many students are doing this. We have now the four courses are done at this moment by 91 students coming from different faculties. Um, and uh, as I said already, the didactic principle of, of doing this program is that students are together in a class. They have different interests, different perspectives, different uh, uh, regular programs. And that very much has a consequence for the discussion. Sometimes we really have a discussion from the law perspective, European law, international law, uh, and other times it is more on, on culture. Uh, and that is sometimes the, the clashing between paradigms, let's say, is, uh, is interesting as well. Um, this is how we, yeah, how we developed over the years. We are doing the honors program since uh, uh, 2013. First, it was European discourses. Oh, sorry, that is still on top. And now we have turned it into the societal challenges of migration. But you can see that we have, um, uh, have received many more students over the years. And what is most interesting, I think, is that it is organized over schools. It is not one school that is responsible. It is a combination of schools and people uh, really thinking we should work together on, uh, on this topic. Now, Lina, this is up to you. Questions? Uh, and maybe the first question that I would uh, like to ask you is, uh, what is the motivation? What was your motivation for doing the program? 
Sure. Um, so maybe I can start by introducing myself first. Uh, I'm Lina. I'm a third year student of international sociology. And uh, my motivation for doing the honors program in general was um, a mix of curiosity, but of course, also I was really um, interested in getting a certain certificate or doing something on top of my u university study just because I felt like sociology in itself, of course, is already very interdisciplinary or has very many uh, possible roads which you can uh, turn to. So I felt like I wanted an honors program that could give me more information on top of my study without kind of just reproducing what I already know. And uh, that's why I found this interdisciplinary honors program very interesting just because I do like to be engaged and different types of like paradigms, different discussions, people that do not have the same opinion as me. And um, I do feel like the honors gives a great platform where a lot of different people can come together, as you already said. Um, and it's just a very nice kind of more relaxed atmosphere than uh, some of my classes, just because we all, we all have it on top of our regular schedule. So sometimes it's just, very okay to not uh, be very prepared for every class, but everyone just kind of helps one another. And I really like that kind of like extra community that you get on top of your regular studies. So uh, I think those are my main motivations to choose, but also keep going, of course, yeah. because sometimes it is quite a lot of work, but I thought it was always manageable. And uh, you have followed two courses now in this migration program. And, and could you tell a bit more about both and the differences between them? Exactly. Uh, so I choose the courses Border and Trajectories and um, the other course that we're having right now, the Migrant Experience one. And um, I would say they are in general uh, talking about similar but very different concepts. So we were talking really a lot more about like what kind of board like what influence borders are really having the, the the social construct of borders um on migration flows and so on and i feel like the class that we're having right now with the migrant experiences and narratives is uh more literary focused instead of really uh policy and um scientifically focused of course, um, that is very interesting to me because I'm not uh, part of culture studies or literary studies. So that really gives me like an extra um, extra thing to analyze and an extra thing to learn, which I really enjoy because I never would have thought when I started studying in general that I would be doing literary analysis, for example, because I always kind of just disregarded it as, oh, that's not as scientific, not as important. Now I very much understand that it's just as scientific as everything else that we do here in uni. Mm -hmm. So um, I really like that all of these program, uh, all of these different courses have very different focuses. So none of these courses, even if they're in the same topic, are actually the same. So I'm also really excited for um, the next course I'm going to be choosing. Um, and I mean, there's also economic focus to that uh, would also be an interesting avenue to look at. And then also, of course, the theoretical perspective, like it's really hard to choose a certain course just because they are kind of so different, but still interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, how does it add to your mm -hmm. regular program that you already said? So you were not expecting yourself to do something like literature or culture studies and mm -hmm. now it comes in. Yeah, it really just, you know, uh, like expands your methodology. It expands the way you're thinking about things. Like, uh, I feel like before that, I was even thinking a bit too one dimensional. And I feel like it really helped me just with my own study, of course, because I could like see, you know, the way I write papers, the way um, I tackle, you know, reading a paper, for example, has been impacted by this course, even if it's you know, just a few courses that you take by the side, it's still something that is with you or that has been with me now for the past one and a half years. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it can really benefit you also on the long run and kind of with your studies yourself, but also just on a personal level, I've always found it very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, fantastic advertisement for the <laughs> program. Uh, and, and maybe one, 
uh, last question, but I like to rephrase it. Uh, not so much what would you advise students, because you are so enthusiastic, I guess, that you advise them to mm. do it. But maybe now rephrase the question in what type of student do you have to be in order to be capable of doing this? Mm. Um, someone who's not overwhelmed by um, having a lot of different topics and a lot of different things to work on and um, someone who is open-minded, someone who is open for discussions, definitely. Um, yeah, I don't think there's one thing as the ideal student, which is why we have so many different departments, such like a diverse mix of people. And I think that's really what it lives for. So I can't really advertise for this one ideal student type, um, but it's really the community and the being together. That being said, of course, um, I'm trying to make it look all really good. And uh, right now, uh, of course, it's gonna be a lot of work and it's still an honors program. So it is not for everyone. It is not, it is something that you should kind of see as a commitment that goes longer than, oh, I'm just gonna have, you know, a diploma in the end because it, you really can't go get far like that. It really has to be coming from your own interest. And um, yeah, just, I think open-mindedness is the biggest part because we're all gonna be confronted no matter which study you're from. I thought in the beginning, like sociology, oh, that's gonna be pretty much the same as what we're already talking about in class, but it really is not. So as long as you're open to information that might not even be in your normal study, do it. Thank you, Lina. Fantastic uh, presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. And, and let me pick up the open-mindedness. I think that that goes for the lecturers as well. Yes. And so you do not have one type of public. It's a bit different from your from my ordinary courses as well. And that is, yeah, that is the fun of it. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. yes. Okay, thank you very much. This was an introduction on honors program as we promised. Uh, and uh, I hope that you see that honors program is an education uh, uh, focus on, on the topic of uh, migration. We are connected to Timiko and Corny Rijke will tell more about uh, Timiko as a researcher network. Uh, but I also see that there are uh, very new initiatives and certainly so with a new strategic plan in mind I think that starts in the coming uh, year so this is also this this meeting today also is an invitation for you to come up with ideas or if you would like to join uh, as a student honors program you can contact via, via the website Karen Berghout if you would like to participate as a teacher do contact us it's it's open we are not very formally structured but really open in order to uh, to work together uh, thank you very much uh, and then I'll give the floor to Courtney thank you Thank you, Odile. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much for this introduction. We now focus a bit more on uh, research. And if you, in the meanwhile time, have uh, questions either about the honors program or later on, if, um, uh, if, if the presentation starts or what I'm going to tell you, uh, then please do uh, um, uh, put them in the chat. Uh, we are here with uh, my colleague uh, Irina Fair, who uh, also assists me in the uh, Timico organization. Uh, and uh, also Odile and I will then pose uh, the questions later on. So that is also for the rest of uh, this afternoon. So uh, thank you for joining us. And I'm very happy that, um, that I can introduce you, well, for some it is an introduction, um, to uh, Timico. Timico is the Tilburg migration uh, community. And uh, we have uh, uh, established this community in early 2020. Uh, and uh, uh, and um, we had our first uh, kickoff event in February in uh, 2020. And then just thereafter came Corona. So we thought uh, then to uh, reconnect again. And that was the aim actually of uh, today with all the researchers, including the students from the honors program and other uh, interested colleagues uh, and persons. But unfortunately that uh, event is uh, organized the way it is organized now. 
Um, so uh, the Tilburg migration community is actually to, uh, to bring together the uh, researchers at uh, our university in the different schools working on uh, migration. So sometimes you had, well, there, there was an event, uh, then you, you, uh, you met a colleague who you didn't know uh, from another school to find out uh, that you work on very similar topics. So um, we, with Timico, we aim actually to create uh, well, a platform, uh, a community where we have the possibility to meet each other, uh, to exchange uh, our ideas, um, and then on the, in the medium or long term also to work more closely together. Um, because migration actually is a uh, topic uh, per, that you uh, that you look at from uh, different lenses and uh, with an interdisciplinary uh, view, actually. Huh? So th that is now also reflected very well, I think, in the uh, honors program, uh, but also in the research. Uh, and I think for most of us working on uh, migration research, we have that interdisciplinary uh, approach. Now, um, so why then uh, do we have um, to look at those uh, different lenses? Well, first of all, migration is a topic that, uh, that manifests itself at different levels. So you have on the international level with uh, increased mobility, uh, with the globalization, a need for a more international approach. But also there is uh, developments on regional level for instance, in the European Union, but not limited to the European Union. Eh? So we have also a Western African community, for instance, where we have uh, that, that is another level and then uh, further down to the national level. How does it actually, uh, how does um, migration, migration law, migration policy, migration integration, how does that work on uh, the national level? Then looking at it from the lens of the uh, individual, um, well, you have uh, the, the, the three phases, so the, uh, the, 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 the phase before people are migrating, but also during the migration and then after uh, the migration, so the pre and peri and post migratory uh, phases, um, where things happen. Uh, and uh, that you can look at uh, isolated, but of course, um, you should look at them uh, more interconnected. Uh, and then there is different types of research. Uh, so you, uh, that's, uh, and, and we have different uh, disciplines, we have different methodologies uh, for doing the research, qualitative, quantitative, uh, normative uh, research, fundamental research, etc. Uh, and if we have the possibility to combine that here uh, at our university uh, within our uh, Tilburg migration community, then I think we can uh, enrich uh, uh, science, uh, but we can also enrich uh, ourselves. So now the uh, aim is uh, of Timico is to have um, regular meetings uh, once every uh, quarter or once every half year, so at least two times a year, um, where we invite uh, or, uh, or uh, one of our researchers wants to present his or her research um, and where we had then have a discussion. Um, but it's also, well, we have our own uh, website that has been uh, established uh, under the uh, IMPACT program because uh, the uh, Timico runs under uh, the IMPACT po program, namely the pillar of a resilient uh, society. So you can find our website and also all the members of our community so far. Uh, you can find them on uh, the website of uh, Timico under the IMPACT uh, program. So if you are interested as uh, the invitation that uh, Odile already uh, gave uh, also applies of course for uh, Timico, then please uh, contact uh, one of us uh, and um, then we uh, connect you to, um, uh, to the work of uh, Timico. So we have a, a, a tw twice a year, we, uh, at least twice a year, we have uh, meetings and then we try to facilitate the, uh, the community and the co communication and the co collaboration uh, within our uh, university. So that is on Timico. So uh, this is another Timico uh, event uh, together with Studium Generale as already was uh, mentioned. And I'm very happy that we have 
to uh, colleagues, to scientists from different uh, schools that are uh, presenting. And first of all, uh, the, the, the first speaker that is uh, Max uh, Spotty. He's an uh, ethnographer and an associate professor at uh, the, the Tilburg School of Humanities and Digital Science. And <clears throat> working amongst other, other uh, topics on the implications of the internet for the process of asylum seekers. And that is also the topic we will be talking about this afternoon, practicing and the politics of suspicions. Then afterwards, he will hand over to, uh, to uh, my colleague Mario Braakman, who is professor at Tilburg Law School. He's a, a psychologist and psychiatrist who specialized in cultural psychiatry and ethnography, worked for many years as a psychiatrist in, uh, and psychotherapist at the clinic for refugees with severe mental disorders. Then afterwards, uh, Christoph, my other colleague, will come to stage to lead uh, the discussion. And for you, uh, the audience, please feel free to uh, write your questions, your observations, your points for discussion in, uh, in the chat, because I'm sure you will have some points. So without further ado, I hand over to, uh, to Max. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. So um, let me set up the timing first. This bit there is fine. Um, well, thank you for having me here, uh, Timiko people. <laughs> thank you for having me here on this program, people. And, and uh, thank you to the people that are at home online, wherever you are, but still online, for listening to my story. A little bit about my background, a couple of minutes. Um, I am, a, yeah, well, depending on where you go to, you are either a sociolinguist or a linguist anthropologist if you go to the US. And if you go to the UK or you tend to hang out in Europe, you are then a linguist ethnographer. Fundamentally, I'm very much interested into what do people do with their identities, with their language, and an ethnographer, what does an ethnographer do, is interested in writing about people and documenting people's lives. And in this case, the documentation of people's lives was about uh, what does it mean to be an asylum seeker in times of globalization, and what does it mean to be an asylum seeker in times of digitalization. That was my driving inquiry, my driving my large focus. I said I should start with the time, by the way, otherwise I'll carry on talking too much. So I'll share with you uh, guys my presentation, which goes back. The presentation is called Trapped into the Matrix of Narrative Immobility, Language, Identities and the Internet in an Asylum Seeking Case. Now, um, the story, uh, to make a long story short, fundamentally the four, as anthropologists do, trying to make uh, the strange familiar, or the familiar strange, it depends on your positionality, have been living for a period of time in an asylum seeking center, in an asylum seeking center in uh, East Flanders. And in this asylum seeking center, I was taken on board as the anthropologist. So on the one hand, you had people telling me, do you work? Are you, are you, you know, a police officer or whatever in this asylum seeking center? No, not at all. Are you then a refugee? Uh, one of us, so to say? And the other answer was, of course, no, I'm not, even though I may look like one, a bit scruffy with a beard. Uh, and, then, and then the last question was, of course, then who the hell are you? And the answer was, I'm somebody as you should be open about your anthropologist doings. I'm somebody very much intrigued about your lives, about your doings in globalization, in digitalization, and in this sociocultural space. So without any further uh, uh, postponing, let's go to the presentation. Now, what types of diversity do we meet in our daily lives, in the news, on socio-technological platforms, or in the streets? We do meet plenty of diversity. We meet the successful diversity that we may encounter in this university, that we may encounter in, uh, in uh, um, companies, so successful diversity at work. We encounter accepted exotic diversity uh, in, in uh, exotic events like this one. Uh, but we also, we, we, we encounter more and more, as you were mentioning before, that diversity is something that is 
making people scared, making nation states scared. Hence, there is a form of securitized diversity in which all of a sudden we see the emergence of borders. Borders that are both controlled, securitized, tangible, but also at times untangible. Another form of diversity, therefore, that comes, that follows this securitized diversity is immobilized diversity. The sort of diversity that Europe, in as much as other continents, don't seem to want on their territory. Or, uh, let's not be so drastic, they maybe want this diversity, but first they need to check that this is the good type of diversity that can be allowed to pass the borders and to enter. Their, um, their soil. So I, I, when I was entering an asylum seeking center, it was an asylum seeking center uh, from the Red Cross and not a federal asylum seeking center. I had to understand for myself from an anthropological point of view, what is actually an asylum seeking center? It's a space, true, but what kind of space is that? Well, it's a, it's a place, first of all, where globalization, and I should add to that digitalization are key. In fact, there, local happenings are shaped by events happening many miles away. What you see, the, the population living, the, the guest, as they are called in the jargon of the asylum seeking center, living in asylum seeking centers are a reflection of political events, of war, of conflicts that are going on and of suppression that is going on many miles away. Second, what, what is actually, who is the migrant nowadays in a global digitalized super diverse time? It's a person who is mobile and who can be made immobile by institutions. But he's also, and I quite like his opposition, is a, is a person with a mobile phone. So we have mobile people, but there are also people with a mobile. And that mobile, this was one of the things that I realized as soon as I entered the center, is a channel for transnational activities, activities back home, uh, activities that may mean the simple sending of remittances back home or receiving money, but also activities that can be uh, looking after your own family, carrying out political actions, um, telling people home how you are doing, and giving them tips about how to start their moves from the rest to the West, so to say. So once you enter an asylum seeking center, you have this glossed over term migrants. But what is a migrant and what are the trajectories time-wise? You can have long-term migrants that are there in the asylum seeking center for two years or more, short-term, new real life migrant, transitory, because once they filed their application, they might go into illegality, high-skilled migrant, low-skilled migrant, uh, highly schooled. Anyway, what is common to all of them is that there are complex trajectories of migration, not anymore, as I said before, moving from the rest to the west, but moving from point A to point, from point A to point B, and maybe back to point A in order to move to point C, wherever is mostly favorable, favorable uh, to, to file A or to try to start a new life. Another, character, another few characteristics that are key and that you emerge from an asylum seeking center is that the people there are confronted with a high integration pressure from institutions, but they're also confronted with a high social power in the informal economic texture of those society. Migrants' home backgrounds in terms of legal, in terms of sociolinguistic, cultural, ethnic, religious backgrounds are not presupposable as we should have thought that they were before globalization and digitalization. So the way in which I've sort of named this asylum seeking center is the waiting room of globalization. The waiting room of globalization in which sense? You are waiting for your destiny to take place. Yeah, I don't know if you guys are uh, acquainted with Goddard at Andan Godot. Yeah, there is these people waiting for Goddard to show up and give them a finally a way where to go toward their future. Well, that's exactly the same thing that you see in a way in, in a um, 
in an asylum seeking center. People wait. People wait for institutions to make a decision. People wait for lawyers to write them a letter. People wait from um, the uh, migration authorities to receive a letter back that approves or disapproves their stay. People fundamentally do a lot, but they also do a lot of waiting. And that waiting seems a passive thing, if you want to describe it in that way, but it's absolutely not so. The sociocultural setting of this, of this study, um, at the asylum seeking center, we had, we had 61 guests, 40 females and 21 males, of which 11 were minors without parents or foster carers. Five entered the center in 2011. By now, these data are rather old, but it's the principle that we are focusing on that are interesting. One entered the center in 2010. I collected this data in 2012. Only two guests were born in the 50s. So in the words of the director of the Asylum Seeking Center, this Asylum Seeking Center is hosting people that are trying their luck in Europe. Um, they move to Europe either because of the political conditions in their own country or because of health reasons or because of uh, gender uh, discriminations reasons. One of the big things that um, happens in the center in this waiting room of globalization, of course, is the fact that there is a continuous issue of identity construction, which is my obsession, so to say, research-wise. I am intrigued by how identity are constructed by institutions. I'm intrigued about how, how identities are constructed discursively by human beings. I'm intrigued about the process of identity construction in what I term power saturated environment like this one but also like the environment in which somebody is telling their life stories to officials police officials immigration officers and so forth i rest my case with this very uh, interesting quote at least in my in my view which i present to my students quite often at 8 45 in the morning on a monday morning and they hate me for that on identity you are who you are partly because of what you do and partly because what you do is recognized for what it is by yourself and the others who are doing it. Something that comes from my old time hero, James G from Disco Studies, and I've reiterated and reappropriated in my, in my work in 2007 about developing identities where I call them informal theories of mind or discursive parameters for the construction of identity. The point. The applicant's own identity claims is assessed against the presupposed truth. Being truthful during your asylum seeking claim is assessed on the basis of knowledge or facts or things that you should know because you claim to come in, to be coming from a, from a given uh, state, from a given city, from a given um, um, sociocultural group, and on the basis of someone's mi micro behavior. The Western, this emphasizes the Western institutional paranoia of belonging. We need to place you somewhere and we will try to place you there on the basis of what we are mostly acquainted with, an equation between one language, one territory, one grouping of people. So very much, the institutions are very much switched onto this equation of one language, one territory, one group of people in which you should be able to fit in. And you should be indigenous, indigenous of a place that you, that you claim to be coming from. So the identity of the applicant is registered, and I will open up this funny term in a moment, in a legal discourse where the notion of truth is central for the acceptance of the applicant's claim. The story that therefore I'm about to present you guys is a story that I define as ergoic, taken from Latin ergo, the therefore. You, came, you claim to come from place X, ergo, you should know some facts, you should know some issues that are at play, you should know the politics of the place, even though maybe you have been belonging to the people that had to flee away, or you have been belonging to the people that were in charge, and all of a sudden there was a coup d'etat, and you had to move away and go for asylum, for instance, in Europe. I'm taking you guys now to um, Conakry, or better, to Guinea-Conakry, and in particular, we will go down to Conakry. And I want you guys to 
take a look at the city of Conakry, but in particular at this area here on the, on, the, on the map, which is the area that will be mostly relevant for the story that we are about to hear from the asylum seeking applicant that I will introduce to you in a moment. Right, our protagonist of this story, because fundamentally what we're doing right now is not just a presentation, I'm narrating the life story of somebody who has been filing for asylum. So this person that I am uh, narrating and giving voice to, we will call him BK. Yeah? He claims to be younger than 18 years old at the time of coming to Belgium, Flanders. He's a Muslim. He claims to be coming from Guinea-Conakry. He claims to come from actually the capital city of Guinea-Conakry, that is Conakry. The father is from the Malinka ethno-linguistic group. The mother is from the Pearl ethno-linguistic group. Authorities decided, quite surprisingly, in my sociolinguistic view, to assign him as the mother tongue, the Malinka mother tongue, which is actually the language of the father. So there is a bit of a contradiction, sociolinguistic contradiction there, that your mother tongue all of a sudden is the language of the father. Furthermore, there is another nice, lovely intricacy there going on. The arbitrary assigned language for the procedure and for the interview and therefore for the conversation that he has been having with the um, uh, officers, immigration officers, was French. Nota bene, French is, of course, present in Guinea-Conakry. Yet again, we are talking of uh, an allegedly 18-year-old uh, man who is barely schooled, who can barely read and write, who has a, um, um, a knowledge of French in that he, he recognizes French and he can utter things in French, but he has never been schooled in French. The only schooling that he has received is Quranic schooling. Therefore, he is highly proficient in classical Arabic. He knows the Quran by heart. However, that's as far as it goes. So that's an interesting and relevant thing. Furthermore, this is, the, this is an interview taking place in Flanders. Well, as you know, in Flanders, French is not really the language that is mostly widely used. So the interviewer is going to have his, her own Belgian accented Flemish variety of French during this interview. That really gets a bit tricky in order to do meaning making. Right, being indigenous, so claim that you're coming from a given place, in order to do so, uh, one needs to know the facts about a country, one needs to know the language of the country, one needs to know enough information in order to keep things real. And here we go back to these westernized ideologies of territory, language, and naming of things that come into play. And here I'm referring to the work of Sue Gal and the work of Gal and Irvine from the linguistic anthropological perspective. And then before I use this um, um, concept, enregisterment. Enregisterment uh, is taken spray from the work of Asif Aga, who um, uses this notion um, in linguistic anthropology and is a process that he def defines as, follow, as follows. A process in which semiotic forms of expression, verbal and nonverbal, are linked with an ideological institutional frame. This linkage, in turn, puts someone's identity in a certain space within a certain institutional frame of true false narrativity. In other words, there are matrices, there are matrices of narrativity that institutions are respecting from the candidate who's applying for asylum seek. Hence, the candidate who's telling a story, the candidate who's writing a story, the candidate who's, who's giving proofs of identity needs to match this register, needs to match this matrix in order to be considered truthful in his claims. I would need about an hour to explain the registerment inside out, but I'll go with a you know, uh, short and sweet slide. In other words, to keep it real, you need to know, as I was trying to say before, the right register. That is, you need to espouse the right cultural model that links forms of semiotic expression to types of identity conducts. And here we go. This is the letter that BK received while I was doing my fieldwork at the Asylum Seeking Center. It's a letter written up, uh, typed up actually in French. 
is from a sociolinguistic, sorry, from a linguistic anthropological perspective, this is an, an artifact. It's a product of narrativity. This is the letter that is basically telling to BK, I'm terribly sorry, my friend, you have to go home. We cannot allow you to stay here in Belgian Flanders. This letter was written up in French, is the summary, so to say, is a textual artifact, is a summary of the interview that has taken place between the Migration Authority and the General Commissioner for Migration in Belgium and BK. Um, it's a very interesting artifact from an anthropological sociolinguistic point of view because it narrates again a story from the matrix of the authority. It recaps a little bit uh, what happened to what happened to BK. BK came on the 7th of February 2012. The father was a Malinka, the mother was, is a Pearl. The family of the parents, they, they wanted to have them separated because of their ethnic differences. And 5th of January, all sorts of things happened till the father was murdered by the, uh, by the family of his mother. And from there, there is the starting of the um, many, uh, many um, uh, disadventures, misfortunes of BK that brought him to flee away from um, Conakry. What I would like to show here is that in, in, in this slide, which is the second part of the letter, the authorities do point out in French, what are the things that make him uh, result as not truthful? So where did he go wrong? Where did BK not manage to match the matrix, the matrix that the authorities wanted to receive in his story? Well, in many things, but I would like also to draw your attention on this line, which is a line in which uh, they talk about the big, the big mosque, La Grande Mosque, Faisal de Conakry, which in the interview, I didn't have access to the actual live interview, I only had access to this artifact and to have a chat with BK and with BK roommates that read out this letter to him because he couldn't read the letter himself. So this letter has been read out to him. Um, this idea of La Grande Mosque. And bear in mind this idea of La Grande Mosque and this name, La Grande Mosque, because it's not the official name of the mosque, right? The official name of the mosque that was retrieved by the, by the immigration officer is the Mosque Faisal, which, by the way, it was retrieved by the officers from the internet, La Vis du Petit Foot sur la Mosque Faisal, publié sur petitfoot.com. Uh, Petit Foot, if you know, it's a website for tourists and it's used in order to give some exotic information about the, for, for those exotic tourists that want to go off to uh, Guinea Conakry and visit Guinea Conakry. So you see that the, the immigration officers themselves have been using not official um, um, indigenous sources, but sources that they can drive from the internet and that support their own understanding of things. To recap and conclude, Following the previous text, BK in that text didn't know a few things. The name of the four areas that make up La Commune, the name of the areas that make up the city, it was happy to call it La Ville, the name of the mosque, La Grande Mosque, the name of the bottled water most sold in Guinea, the name of the money used in Guinea, it was happy to call it L'Argent. Remember, all this happened in French and it was not, you know. The name of a football team in Guinea, which is something that a boy of his age should know, of course, accordingly to the authority. The name of any Guinean TV channel, he was happy to call it La TV. The name of the market where he went with his father, Le Marché, according to BK. Now, discrepancy of registers. If I was taking, instead of the mosque of Faisal, I was taking these other monuments, right? The Coliseum, which you, of course, all know. And I was being interviewed uh, by a police officer who was trying to claim whether I'm really from the place that I'm indigenously from, Italy. Then I would have a bit of a difficulty because I call this place Il Colosseo, okay? Now, 
Here we go again, the same with the big mosque, La Grande Mosque, while he should have been saying La Mosque du Faisal. Here we go. This is the way in which you can actually name the Colosseum. The Latin name is Amphitheatrum Flavium. The Italian official name is Amphitheatro Flavio. In standard Italian, and it's Il Colosseo. In Roman variety of Italian is Er Colosseo. And tourists quite happily call it the Colosseum. In anthropology, what you do, you go off and do a tertium comparazione. So you compare your findings in the asylum seeking centers with other people that were present in the asylum seeking centers. So I interviewed other people from Guinea Conakry and asked them, look guys, how about this mosque? How do you call it? All of them agreed that the common name for this, people, for this mosque was La Grande Mosque. That's as far as it goes. None of them could actually recite, because it's a matter of reciting a story, the exact official name that, by the way, the authorities had found on Petit Foot, which is a um, um, tourist website uh, for, for naming this mosque. Here we go back. Register discrepancy. Register discrepancy, the discrepancy of a narrative matrix, the discrepancy of naming things and how somebody named things right. Thank you very much. And I will conclude it here. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Massimiliano, for your a very interesting talk. I hope we have some time to discuss it. So I'll hurry up because uh, we are <clears throat> we don't have much time anymore. But I'll try to stick to twenty minutes. And let's see. Um, thanks for inviting me. My name is again Mario Brachmann and indeed I'm a psychiatrist, that is someone who studied medicine for six years, get his master and then decides to study five more years to become a psychiatrist. But that wasn't enough for me, I created my own honors program by uh, studying anthropology as well and I did field work and I uh, finished my master as well in anthropology and that creates a kind of a schizophrenic professional identity I'm afraid because uh, very often I do things as a psychiatrist that uh, the anthropologist in me says well don't do that and uh, so it's quite busy inside my head but uh, I still feel very healthy and I want to do well um, I was asked to, to give some reflections on migration and asylum seekers. And I work with uh, asylum seekers for about 25 years that, that are my main patient group. And uh, nowadays I redirect my attention to what we call illegal migrants, but people are not illegal. So I prefer the name undocumented, uh, unassured uh, people who stay in the rings of the Netherlands and hide. And um, so uh, my whole career, I'm busy with uh, asylum seekers, refugees. <clears throat> and um, I have some reflections I want to make as an anthropologist, not as an anthropologist, but as a psychiatrist. And um, as you might know, um, in psychiatry, we have a kind of holistic view that we look at the biopsychosocial world so we take three perspectives at the same time and that's the way we look at our patients and from every perspective i want to give you a, a small reflection and a, a, a quick idea i do it is uh, about bio biology i i focus on ethnicity and pharmaceuticals and the social aspect i focus on acculturation 
and the psychological thing is all about cultural identity. That just three examples of a very complex working area. But let's start with something positive. And uh, of course, when migrants are in the news, especially asylum seekers, then uh, it's all about culture shock, forced migration, war and trauma, and post-traumatic stress disorder, mood disorders, anxiety, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's all true. We have uh, <clears throat> a group of people with very severe problems, and uh, it's very tough for them. But let me first start with stressing also the other side, and that is um, people uh, go through certain developmental stages called separation integration phases. That is that the first one happens when you are a very young child, and then suddenly you start to realize that you are not the same person as your mother, but you are different. You are, have, are an own individual. And then the first separation process takes place between you and your mother or mother figure. The second one is in puberty, when you um, uh, have another separation phase from your, from your family. And um, Salman Akhtar tells us that refugees migrants in general have a third individuation phase. They have the, a, 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 th a third separation and in, in this sense from the culture of origin. And uh, that third individuation phase is something very interesting and very positive. That is not something that can be achieved by non-migrants. And uh, anthropologists try it by doing some field work and we get a, a cultural relativistic stance more or less, but uh, migrants uh, have a special extra thing that most people who do not migrate don't have. And how many non-migrants are there in the world? That's the other thing I want to stress. This is my own Y chromosome, my DNA. I send it to a laboratory and they have geneticists who can tell me how the father of my father of the father of mine migrated across the globe. And of course, it started all in Africa itself, where it's the red point there. And uh, it started about 200,000 years ago. And for 100,000 years, people migrated through Africa. And after 1,000 year, uh, 100,000 years, um, a few of them thought, well, let's go to uh, Saudi Arabia and let's see how life is over there. And then uh, just a few hundred people who migrated to Saudi Arabia. And from there, uh, they migrated through Europe, Asia, North and South America, Australia, etc. Why is this important? This is my first perspective, the biological one. It's important because uh, during that migration uh, process, um, <clears throat> there are a lot of genetic differences who occur and they are important uh, because uh, um, enzymes in our body, especially in the liver, they vary between ethnic groups. They are not the same. And uh, why is that important? Because uh, Due to migration, non-Western populations are confronted, exposed to Western pharmaceutical products, pills, medicines. And um, um, all available medicines in pharmacies in the Netherlands, in Europe, or in the United States, all those products uh, that can be uh, obtained by prescription only by a doctor, all those products are tested among white Western populations. So we do not know how these medicine behave in people who come from other parts of the world. And uh, from the few studies we do have, and I know all of them, I guess, 
uh, we know that there can be huge differences in effect. There can be huge differences in side effects. And even I think that people could die because of uh, doctors not knowing what they really are doing with uh, someone else's body or mind in prescribing certain medicines. And what we did here is um, we um, <clears throat> did a study and assembled all um, available studies in the metabolism of drugs. And, and this is a system called uh, 2C19. And what, 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 you, what can be shown here is that, you, you know, um, the liver gets rid of your medicines that are entering your body. And that's good because medicines are kind of toxic substance and they need to leave the body again. So, this system, 2C19, gets rid of a lot of medicines in your body. However, um, <clears throat> they do that at a certain normal rate and uh, not too fast, not too slow. However, if you look worldwide and you see that there are huge differences across populations in the world. And if you look at the top, it's difficult to see, but that's India over there and um, Pakistan up to 80% of the population there are non-normal metabolizers. So they do get rid of those drugs in a non-normal way. So they are deviant in one way or another. And uh, that's very peculiar because normally uh, what is deviant is a minority of patients. In this case, 8% of uh, the patients, that's a majority. And so the majority of people in India, they metabolize uh, medicine in a very different way in their body. And we should know all these kinds of things. And there's a lot to know about, but I'm not going to explain everything today. That's due to time limits. I, I switch to the second, the social level, and this as a psychiatrist treating people from other countries, other cultures, this helps me a lot, this uh, little matrix. Um, people who migrate uh, can follow uh, four main strategies of acculturation. They can become alienated, acculturated, remain in the traditional sense, uh, uh, by not uh, adopting the culture in which they migrate to, but they remain in their culture of origin and recreate that in the Western world. Or they can become bicultural in which they have their own culture of origin and adopt more or less the Western culture. And, and this is, uh, very helpful in trying to understand people um, um, if they come with psychiatric problems. And um, <clears throat> you need a kind of sociocultural context, a social context to, to understand them better. Even certain uh, criminal acts can be explained by this schedule. And it's, it's only, it consists only of two dimensions. That is, uh, do you keep your culture of origin or do you get rid of it? And what do you do, do, you do with the Western culture? Do you accept it in, in this case, the Dutch culture or do you not accept it? And that can lead to separation, marginalization, integrations, etc. So this is a very helpful scheme. And, um, <clears throat> Going to the uh, psychological level of identity, is a, it's uh, completely different from medicines or social context, but it's also related to everything. And um, to go from the social to the psychological, let me give you a small personal background. I uh, was raised in three languages, German, Dutch, and my own native language, and that's Ripuarian. And Ripuarian is a language that not many Dutch people know about, but it's a Dutch language. And as you can see, 
here on the bottom right, you see five colors. And those are the five different colors uh, of the Limburg languages that are spoken, of five of them. However, if you look at the South Limburg, you see in the, in the East, a small part which is white. And that part is on this overview to the left, has another color and it's uh, this violet kind of color and it's uh, the riparian area and it's uh, spoken in Kerkrade, Vals and Bochols and that's where I'm from. So if we look at the um, <clears throat> cultural identity, um, let me first say that it is very important for my patients and for me as a psychiatrist who, who tries to assess what, what's going on with them and what is their problem and how to solve it. It's very crucial to have a, an idea of uh, identity and cultural identity uh, especially, but it's very difficult to to, to get hold on because it is not something that is fixed, it is fluid. And le uh, let me take myself as an example again. If uh, the Dutch soccer team plays against Germany, then I feel Dutch. But if Ajax plays, again, plays against the team out of Limburg, then I feel uh, that I belong to Limburg. But if uh, Venlo, uh, plays against Maastricht, then I feel South Limburg. And when MVV from Maastricht plays against Rode JC, which is in the east of South Limburg, and that's remind, it's the, the riparian area, then I feel very much riparian, but only then. And um, so uh, that's what I mean by identity, cultural identity. It's fluent and uh, it's not a property of a person. It took me a while to discover that, but it's, it's, it tells us something about relationships uh, between me and other persons. And uh, often as Muslim Riano showed as well, it, um, we often think that identity and knowledge about or local knowledge is, is location and space and time bound. But um, increasingly the world shows us that it's not any more location or time bound. And uh, we are entering a new era in which uh, uh, questions about identity become more confused, but I cannot explain it in total now, but um, let me finish due to time restraints with my last uh, attention I have. And that's what I would like to call cultural empathy. And empathy is something a psychiatrist and a psychologist needs to understand another person, his patient. And it's, it becomes very tough if that patient comes from another culture, because in that case, we also have to bridge two different cultures. And that's quite tough. We do that on the left side with what I call perspective production. We have uh, methods to reconstruct the cultural context of a patient and of the complaints he or she has. That um, uh, very interesting technique. So you will have to master in order to be able to, to reconstruct the culture as far as necessary for a psychiatrist to make a good diagnosis and treatment plan. However, that's only half of it. On the upper right corner, you see that there, are, there is also something we call, um, I would call perspective suppression. It sounds negative, but we as medical doctors, we also have our professional and personal cultural backgrounds and we have our ethnocentric reflexes. And if we do not get rid of them, we will never be able to understand another person. So we'll have to um, take a 
quite extreme relativistic stance in order to uh, discover that our own professional or personal ideas are just uh, ideas and that we need to uh, to um, to suppress them every now and then to be able to come to a real understanding with your patient and um, for now that's some reflections from my part thank you very much for your attention okay then i suggest we move forward <clears throat> Okay, so uh, first of all, many thanks for, okay, we're still on the, and this one, nice, so uh, hi everyone there, now I'm also uh, on the screen. Um, uh, so thank you, first of all, for these uh, interesting uh, presentations. There were already quite some uh, questions in the chat, so I will uh, start with that. I also wrote down some uh, questions that I have, but we will see also um, for the sake of time if we manage to tackle them as well. And if not, maybe you have some time um, afterwards. Um, uh, so first of all, uh, there was a comment uh, for, um, for Max from CK. That was the, the name on, on Zoom. Yeah, uh, probably. <laughs> and he or she um, indicates that uh, you provide a very interesting example of how people use mental informal uh, institutional uh, matrices. Uh, but can you elaborate how this uh, connects with confirmation bias, uh, particularly during an interview? Right. Um, no, one thing. Yeah, sure. One thing I do have to say is that I was not there present at the interview because nobody can have access to the interview. I mean, even if I would have written a letter to the Prime Minister of Belgium, I wouldn't have been able to access that. So uh, what I do know, however, what I did have access to, however, were the files of BK. He was informed about the fact that I was having access to his files. And, and these was... Uh, the one that I presented was the main textual artifact, which resume, which which summarizes in a way um, uh, the how the interviews went. So I had to base myself on, well, not on BK telling me about how it went with the interview, because I didn't want to be interviewed about it. But I had to base myself on a textual artifact and all the other documents that I encountered. So I do not know what actually happened at that very moment in time in the interview between the, office, the migration officer and uh, the applicant, so BK. What I do know though, is that that interview took place in French. And as I tried to explain before, there were two different varieties of French being involved there. A, a, I assume a rather heavily accented uh, West Flemish variety of French and a, and a rather heavily accented uh, Conakry variety of French. So that's something that I can say. Yeah, so in the meantime, I also got um, uh, one. And following up on that, um, when such language issues occur, um, would it be an option or what, what, what could be the role of, of a person in between, like a, a translator? Uh, would that introduce some yeah. extra bias in there, or well, would that, that be? A that good that seems to be that seems to be a blessing on the one end because, of course, you would think uh, the 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 applicant would be able to express himself or herself in uh, the language he or she feels most confident with. But once I've been doing uh, a, a mapping of the linguistic repertoire of BK. One of the things, the interesting thing that came up was that he wasn't ever so confident in Malinka as they attributed him to be the mother tongue. He was rather confident in Pearl, which was the mother tongue from the mother's side, the actual mother tongue, if you look at it from, you know, language of father, language of a mother. 
But the language they was mostly confident with was Sousa. And Sousa belongs to the Malinkas language, language family and is a language that is purely and solely used for transactional purposes. So it's the language that me and you would use when I'm buying fish and vegetables from you from a market. And that also triggered in my head an idea of, hang on a moment, BK was not born and bred in, in, in uh, Conakry. It was coming from someone else. And then he moved to Conakry to get a job and so forth. And maybe all of his family moved to Conakry. That was just a sociolinguistic supposition of mine. Of course, getting to know BK's um, roommate that was also from Conakry explained all sorts of things to me in terms of their sociolinguistic background, in terms of the fact that the two families knew one another because of an encounter that they had on Skype of all channels where the BK's roommate had been meeting uh, um, BK's mother who made sure that he was doing his preaching, Quranic preaching every day, otherwise he would have been a bad boy and so forth and so forth. And then there is a whole chapter, linguistic anthropological chapter there about the linguistic background of these two characters and how they influence my understanding of what has been going on in that interview. So going back to point one, even if you would have had an interpreter there, it would have been rather difficult to know that he was mostly proficient in Sosa. And then the interpretation might have happened in Malink, but Malink was the language of a father. So which interpretation would have we been having? So there is a lot of language barriers going on there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And maybe um, <clears throat> one thing that came up in the chat, of course, is that uh, there have been some criticisms on, on Barry's model. And, and one of the things that was kind of funny in the, um, to see is that the, the figure that you showed made this opposition between traditional and Western, which Michael Bender in the chat indicates that generally now today we talk more about cultural maintenance and cultural adoption so that there is a, a difference there. But uh, what I was wondering is whether you could elaborate a bit on uh, if we connect both presentations and, and uh, your ideas that uh, asylum seekers are in the waiting room of globalization. Uh, what is that doing with, uh, with asylum seekers from a psychiatric uh, perspective? What is the impact of being in that waiting room? Well, we know from uh, certain studies that um, <clears throat> if you stay two years in that waiting room, that psychopathology doubles. It means that uh, people who arrive, about 20% have depressive disorder and about 20% have post-traumatic stress disorder. If, if they wait two years in that room with uncertainty, then it's 40% depressive disorder and 40% post-traumatic stress disorder. We are not yet sure about the causal, the causal link, but we all know that it's very likely that it's due to the fact that they are waiting for uh, permission to stay. What it does in addition to that is it causes uh, um, an extreme form of paranoia. However, it is uh, a survival mechanism. It's not pathological paranoia, but it's a kind of a healthy way to be very much aware of uh, what are people doing to me? Uh, uh, is it okay here? Uh, they are vigilant. And um, um, if an inexperienced psychiatrist see a patient like that, he, he will think that he is psychotic. He has a delusion, he's paranoid, but he's not. Uh, and it's very difficult to make a good differentiation between someone who is paranoid in the sense that he has a severe form of psychopathology or he or she is paranoid in the sense of a healthy way of surviving. And in especially in asylum seekers, that's very difficult. And that paranoia increases because um, people are in that waiting room and they, don't, they cannot feel secure. So in my clinic, the first thing we do is try to make people feel a little bit secure. And we have several techniques of doing that, but that's just two of the things that is happening with uh, patients. 
And uh, are these issues that are taken also into account by the authorities in the sense that I can imagine, well, people arrive, they have post-traumatic stress disorder, they might, that might also lead to uh, not recalling certain passages in their uh, personal history. Um, once they get to, uh, to psychiatrist, is that something that is also submitted, some reports to the authorities that they take into account during the asylum procedure, or is that a separate track? It is uh, a, se a separate track, but there are uh, lines between those uh, tracks. Uh, um, as a medical doctor who uh, I, I, um, I'm not allowed to declare anything about my own patients. I can tell a third doctor what my diagnosis is or what my treatment is if my patient agrees that I give that information. But besides that, I'm not allowed to tell anything. So how severe someone's suicidal thoughts are, it's not allowed for me to say anything about that. Uh, if a certain psychotherapy is available in uh, Congo, I'm, I'm not allowed to tell whether it is available or not. That are uh, 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 a separate circuit of doctors is doing that. And so there is a clear division line between that, but there are a lot of borderline fights between doctors and uh, lawyers about that. Because a lot of lawyers uh, try to persuade doctors to, to tell uh, a lot of other things as well. And a lot of doctors who don't know uh, what, what, what their uh, limitations are, they, they do that and the lawyers can use that in court. And um, however, the doctors are doing things that they are not allowed to do. That's uh, one of the many fights uh, in, in, in that situation. Besides that lawyers, uh, they have only article 64, no, uh, uh, yeah, 64 uh, from the Vreemdelingenwet. Um, um, and that law is, is just, you know, if, if you break a leg and you cannot walk to the plane in at Schiphol, then the Dutch government says, okay, it's okay if you first let, 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 let that leg heal for about six weeks and then we deport you. And that article is used by a lot of lawyers to try to get their clients uh, permission to stay. And um, um, for a doctor, it's terrible because uh, as long as someone is ill, he's allowed to stay. But as soon as he's better, he has to he have to go. So uh, that is for a doctor an impossible situation. But for a lawyer, it's the only thing they have. Okay, uh, very interesting. I guess there's also some questions in the chat, but I just wanted to ask about no or no questions in the chat. Yeah, I don't have an overview. But uh, can I ask one more question? I, I was intrigued by your, um, uh, by your ideas about uh, migrants going through a third uh, individuation. Um, uh, but then I was wondering, do we see differences in these individuations, uh, third individuation processes, depending on the type of migrants? Because uh, you talk, for example, about uh, um, the, the, the typical first individuation when people, uh, young children start to realize, okay, um, uh, I'm, I'm a person myself, eh? and, but so because refugees and asylum seekers, they go through quite different processes compared to, let's say, um, highly skilled migrants or international students. Uh, I guess they all go through, through that third individuation process, but aren't the outcomes, or do we know anything, whether the outcomes are different or whether there's more um, friction in these processes uh, according to the type of migrants? That's just a scientific curiosity. Yeah, uh, you're right. There are a lot of different scenarios and possibilities and uh, also among, among uh, economic migrants. And, uh, but also there you see big difference between people who came from Turkey and from Morocco, for instance. If you look at uh, the... Um, elder first generation Turkish uh, women, 
they often, uh, not often, but uh, there's a, a large group who recreates a kind of Dutch-Turkish community and they don't learn Dutch. They go to the Turkish supermarkets and they have Turkish friends and they, they, they rebuild a new kind of Turkish community in, inside the city. And that's completely different from uh, Moroccan women, uh, not everyone, of course, because otherwise it would be stereotyping, but they uh, uh, engage much more in Dutch society and become bicultural and uh, with a lot of advantages. And the, the individuation phase in, in that instance is, is much bigger, has more impact because they are much more confronted with two different kinds of cultures. And while um, some Turkish women try to isolate themselves and to try to stick to a newly reconstructed traditional cultural issue, but I'm not allowed, I guess, to use the word traditional. <laughs> Okay, let's go to Odil. You have a question as well. Wait. Very interesting with that. Oh, yeah, I would like to um, uh, to combine what you tell uh, your your uh, both your researches because uh, if I would sort of um, explain what Max is doing doing, and I'm a bit a bit superficial, making it more superficial than it is. But the point very much is that there is a sort of ba Babylonic confusion about who is supposed uh, or what language are you using as the the um, the, of the officer, let's say, and the one who is arriving? Huh? And there is a lot of confusion in between what type of language should you use. And in your case, I think, Mario, it's the same, but even more difficult. So when someone, you mentioned someone from the Congo or something, who is uh, who has difficulties in... Huh? In, in making a life of getting a life of behavior he's he has from uh, traumatic stress what what language then is used or or do you um, experience the same type of confusion in language and if someone has a problem how do you cope with that as a doctor yeah uh, may i ask her first uh, yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, uh, um a lot of things come into my mind right now, but let's start with that language for a psychiatrist is the most important instrument we have. What a, what a knife is for a surgeon is language for a, a, a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist. So language is extremely important and we cannot do without professional translation translators but even because you you never can use a 12 year old child and talk about the traumas of her mother with her as an interpreter that's impossible and you could never get an idea of how suicidal someone is if you make use of acquaintances uh, people like that so you need a professional translator but even if you have that and i had once uh, I, I learned a lot from West African patients because, um, you know, one of the first questions you ask is, what, what is your mother tongue? And very often, um, the, mother, the, the name of the, 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 the mother tongue is also the name of the ethnic group to some, where someone belongs, but not always. And in this case, we have a big problem. And then I noticed that my question, what is your mother tongue? was translated by the uh, interpreter into the question, what is the language of your mother? Which is something different as we saw in your example. And so from that moment on, I, I realized that I, I always, I never asked what is your mother tongue, but I always asked what is the first language that you learn to speak and talk in, in your uh, in your life and then you can avoid things like that but but language is so important for us and even if you use a good interpreter you can teach him a lot of things more that you because they must translate in a different way for a psychiatrist than they translate for a surgeon that's one thing but um, there is always things that get lost if i ask are you married in dutch it's Trau, loyalty. In Spanish, estás casada. Ben je onder de pannen? Are you below a roof? Are you a host? 
it, it has another connotation. And in my, the language, the Indian language I learned, Tsukana Bill is, uh, are you married? Tsukana Bill, it's Yucatec Maya. But literally, the question Tsukana Bill means, is your way accomplished? Your way of life, has that been accomplished? And that is another expression of are you married so there are three different types of and they all mean the same you translate it the same way but they mean different things and that's something that always get lost because you cannot translate the context you can only translate words i don't know well and lost in translation <laughs> totally um what can i say um what i can say is also the fact that, well, mind you, this case took place about 10 years ago by now, and there are some other cases of that kind. And some people have been telling me, why, why was this case not, not sorted out with the use of artificial intelligence and automated translation? You know, someone speaks in Google and the other one, Google Translator, for instance, and the other one listens back to the answer in the language that they wish. And now we go back again to point one, what you were mentioning. Um, the values and the um, attached to a given language, the political values attached to a given language, the economic prestige attached to a given language, but also the uh, worldview, even though you know, I'm almost jumping into a sapir world hypothesis, which I don't want to do, they are very relevant in these um, translation cases. Yeah, I think we need to round up here because it's five o'clock, the end of this uh, session. But uh, first of all, uh, again, thanks for the speakers today also, including Lina also for presenting the honors program. Thanks again also for the organization by Studium Generale and to all the people that are attending uh, online. Uh, you will hear from us soon uh, from Timiko about uh, a next date and a next event that we will organize. Hopefully next time, no uh, fifth COVID wave, but uh, that we can do that on campus. Enjoy your evening, everyone. Mm -hmm.